Today we dive into the cal stem for verbs. Let's go. Now cal means simple. This is the simple, most basic stem. This is the stem from which all other stems are derived. It's an important foundation. Let's take our time. Let's get it right. If you recall from last video, the actions art, meaning the force of the cal stem is simple action and it is active in voice. Now today specifically, we're going to cover the cal perfect. Cal is the stem, perfect is the conjugation. Now, as far as cal is concerned as a stem, its action art is simple action. That can be transitive, meaning its action is in transit. And by that, we mean it takes a direct object or it could be intransitive, meaning it does not take a direct object. He hit the ball. That's an example of a transitive. He died. That's an example of intransitive. There's one more simple action category, and that is stative. These are verbs that communicate some sort of state of being. Clever, right? Now in English, stative verbs include to be. So when we translate from Hebrew to English, we must include to be. So for example, he is old. Is old is stative. Now, for the most part, stative verbs by definition are intransitive. Why? Because they cannot take a direct object. Now, the perfect conjugation, now I might slip and accidentally say perfect tense. What I really mean is perfect conjugation. The aspect of the perfect conjugation, meaning the force of this conjugation, is completed action. This is action completed in the mind of the writer or the speaker. Typically, in English, it's going to be translated as a past tense. Now here, when I'm referring to English, past tense is the correct terminology. Hebrew doesn't have tense, and that is because Hebrew does not have time built into its verbs. It strictly derives time from context. So the English typically will tr be translated as a past tense verb or past perfect. So past tense is he studied. Past perfect would be he had studied. Now it could also be a future perfect. Woo. He will have studied. All of these show some sort of completed action, whether in reality or purely in the mind of the speaker or the writer. If the Cal perfect is used with a stative verb, translate it as present tense. He is wise. This is why we say there's no time built into Hebrew verbs. It's derived from context. And that's why we can see examples of the perfect in the Cal stem being past, present, or future. It's all based on context. And the same is true of verbs of perception. Use the present tense in English. This is to know, to love, feeling, emotion. These are verbs of perception. Use the present tense when you translate it to English. So in short, the perfect conjugation has aspect. That aspect means force. The force of the verb is completed action, whether in the past, whether in the present, or whether in the future. That is the perfect conjugation's aspect. So now with all of the prolegomena aside, let's dive into the Cal perfect strong verb. You might recall from last video, I said we were gonna focus on strong first, then we'll get into weak verbs. So today we're focusing on Cal perfect strong. Now the Cal perfect is the suffix or what might sometimes be called the suffix conjugation. This is because the verb adds a suffix at the end of the word. Now remember, we have the root. These are typically three consonants that form the root. The root can transcend 
verbs, nouns, they form basically cognates or a word family as I like to call it. That might not be the right terminology, but that's what I like to say. So we saw before examples of melek, king, and malak, to reign. Same consonants, that's part of the same root. Now the root becomes the stem, and in this case, we're looking at the cal stem. And the cal stem adds a suffix at the end to show you, is it third person? Is it first person? Is it second person? Is it singular or is it plural? Is it masculine? Is it feminine? Is it common? So what we're gonna learn today are the diagnostics of the Cal perfect in the strong verbs. The proper term for these suffixes is suformatives. Yeah, I'm not gonna use that terminology. Uh, no, I, I mm -mm. nope, not happening. What we're about to go over, you need to memorize. Be able to write it forwards, backwards, upside down, upright. I don't care which orientation, you need to know it. You need to know it backwards and forwards like the back of your hand. Get it right and get it tight. Learn everything. Consonants, the vowels, all the pointings, accents, get it all. Don't skip on any of the details. Don't be lazy. Put in the work and you'll be thankful for it later. And when you practice speaking it, and you should because learning language is not just a visual process. It's also auditory. So practice saying it, speak it. Say it aloud, even if it sounds weird, even if it sounds funny, even if you get it wrong, it doesn't matter. It's all part of the learning process. Okay, connect the dots from the eye to the ear. Say it, speak it, sound it out. And when you do, make sure you slow down and get it right, to the best of your ability anyways. You see all the time, I get the pronunciation wrong. It happens all the time, all too frequently. That's not the point. What matters is recognition. Am I learning the concepts? That's the point. Whether you can say it perfectly or not doesn't matter. Not for our purposes anyways. It's not like we're gonna go off and do a competition uh, recital or something. No, no, we're in it to win it. We're in it for the fun. We're in it because we want to learn Hebrew. We're in it because we want to study the word of God. We're in it because we like learning the language. It's fun. Enjoy it. This is all part of the process. But when you are speaking it, when you are saying it to yourself, or maybe saying it to someone else, like, I don't know, your child, your teenager who does not care, whatever you got, your dog, your cat, your fish, I don't know, your significant other, say it to someone, have fun with it. But when you say it, try to differentiate the sounds. Katal, katal. <laughs> Normally I would just say katal, but katal. Now I know there's a comets and I know there's a pathak. Why? Because I've got a long A and a short A. See the difference? Now, the reason why cal is so important, the suffixes remain the same across all derived conjugations. That's why it's so important. Memorize these now, and you've already learned half of all the other conjugations diagnostics. Hey, that's a good bang for the buck, right? So put in the time now, get it right, get it tight. So here we go. This is the Cal perfect strong. We're looking at katal. It means to kill. Katal, to kill. Third masculine singular is what we start with. Katal, there's no suffix. Third feminine singular, katla. Notice the meth egg there next to the comets. That signifies it's a comets, not a comets hatuf. Why? Because it's a closed, unaccented syllable. So normally we would expect it to be a comets hatuf, but in this case, it remains a comets, hence the metheg is present to indicate it's a comets. And we have our first suffix, comets hey. Now that looks somewhat familiar, right? Because in our nouns, comets hey was for the feminine. Second masculine singular, katalta. Notice the accent changes here. And we have our next suffix, ta. 
Notice the tav in the suffix has a dagesh lene, a hardening. So instead of a th sound as in the, we have a t t t, -t sound as in Tommy, katalta. Second feminine singular, katalt. First common singular, katalti. Notice the accent changes. It goes to penultima. And then we have our suffix t. Tav with a dagesh lene plus hiric yod. Katlu, third masculine plural. Notice the metheg showing its accomments. The suffix is the shirik. Notice that third common is plural. There is no masculine plural, feminine plural. It's just purely third common plural. So it's a little bit more simple. Sure, yeah, that's right. Kitaltem. Second masculine plural. Kitalten. Second feminine plural. Katalnu. First common plural. Now, the perfect represents some sort of simple action. And for simplicity's sake, no pun intended, we'll go ahead and translate it here as past tense English. So, the third masculine singular, katal, he killed. Second feminine singular, katla, she killed. Second masculine singular, katalta, you killed. Second feminine singular, katalta, you killed. First common singular, katalti, I killed. Third common plural, katlu, they killed. Second masculine plural, kataltem, you killed. Second feminine plural, katalten, you killed. Katalnu, first common plural, we killed. So by learning not only the suffixes, but also the vowel pointings across katal here in the cal perfect, you should be able to fill out all of these verbal roots in the Cal perfect. Yashav. I know I said words that begin with yod become a first yod weak verb. Yashav is not one of them. Yashav, zakar, kathav, shamar, kavats. Go ahead and give it a shot. Try writing these out. Go ahead and pause the video, practice, and come back. So here's the answers to all of those verbs, starting with yeshav. We have yeshav, yashva, yeshavta, yeshavta, yeshavti, yashvu, yeshavtem, yeshavten, yeshavnu. For zakar, we have zakhar, zakhra, zakharta, zakharte, zakharti, zakhru, zakhartem, zakharten, zakharnu. For kathav, we have Kathav, Kathva, Kathavta, Kathavta, Kathavti, Kathvu, Kathavtem, Kathavten, Kathavnu. For Shamar, we have Shamar, Shamra, Shamarta, Shamarta, Shamarti, Shamru, Shamartem, Shamarten, Shamarnu. And last, for Kavats, we have Kavats, Kavtsa, Kavatsta, Kavatsta, Kavatsti, Kavtsu, Kavatstem, Kavatsten. Kavatsnu. Now, if any of the verbal roots we're dealing with end in a tav, then the tav in the suffix will replace the tav in the root. And then the dagesh lene becomes a dagesh forte, which is a doubling of the tav. Look at karath, to cut. The second masculine singular is karata. Note that the tav merged with the other tav for the suffix. So the dagesh lene becomes a dagesh forte, representing a doubling of the tav. This is a process we call assimilation. The same thing will happen when the verbal root ends in a noon with the third common plural. The noon doubles up with the suffix nu, so. The two noons assimilate, and we see a dagesh forte in the noon. So look at shikan, for example. In the third common plural, it becomes shikanu. Now, sometimes 
the Thav and the Noon can assimilate. What? That's right. So when we have a suffix with a with a Tav and the verbal root ends in a Noon, the Noon will assimilate into the Tav and be represented by a Dagesh Forte. So look at the verb Nathan, for example. It ends in a Noon. So the second masculine singular becomes Nathata because the noon assimilates into the tav. The tav takes the dogish forte to represent that there's assimilation with a noon. Nathata. Now let's talk about state of verbs. These are classified based on the stem vowel. The stem vowel is the last vowel in that word. So we have pathak statives like gadal. It's a pathak as the last vowel. We have tsere statives, kaveid, and we have holum stative, katol. Now the pathak statives are just like we've already seen, no changes there. So you should already be able to fill out the cal perfect for pathak stative verbs. Note the changes for tsere and holum stative verbs. Tsere, for the most part, will change to a pathak, except for the third masculine singular. It really just follows the cal perfect paradigm we've already learned all the way down with a pathak except for third masculine singular which retains the tsere. It's that simple. For holum stative, the holum is retained unless the first syllable is closed and ends in a silent shava. One other note on the holum stative class is that in the second person plural, whether masculine or feminine, the holum changes to comets hatuf. We know it's comets hatuf because it's a closed, unaccented syllable without a metheg. Now, state of verbs are identical to their adjective forms. Remember, we are dealing with word families. So our root may dip its toes into nouns and adjectives. Those adjectives will look just like the third masculine singular of our verb cognates. Kaveth, to be heavy. Kaveth, heavy. One is the verb, cal perfect, third masculine singular. One is the adjective, masculine singular. So don't get tripped up. Just know that sometimes the word will be functioning as a verb. Sometimes it will be functioning as an adjective. Be aware of it. Of course, context will be key. Now, both perfect as well as imperfect, mind you, Hebrew uses lo. This is the negative particle, usually translated not, not. And it negates the action of the verb. Typically it's lo, lamed, holum, aleph. Sometimes it's lamed, holum, vav, aleph. Either way, it's the same word. The negative particle precedes the verb, always. Lo zakarta et habarit. You did not remember the covenant. There's also the particle ine, or hen with the makef, or hain, or hen. It means behold. It's basically an interjection. Now it can stand alone or it can take type one pronominal suffixes. When we add first common singular, ni, or it could be nengi with second masculine singular, nka, second feminine singular, nak, third masculine singular, heno, first common plural, hinnu, or nenu, second masculine plural, inachem. There is no second feminine plural attested. Hinam, third masculine plural. So normally it's behold, but there's three different ways Hebrew uses it. One is to add emphasis. So it's emphatic. It stresses the importance of something. This is the interjection. Or it can demonstrate the immediate presence of something entering the scene. So this is something uh, about existence. And last, it could be used to point towards a fact or a situation upon which a previous statement was made. And with that, thank you for watching. I hope you found this video helpful. Go practice your CalPerfect strong verbs. 
learn those paradigms, make sure you get it right, get it tight, and we'll see you next time. Until then, if you want to continue watching, check out this video here. This is the intro to verbs. It's a good reminder leading us to next week. See you later.